So I'm in, often invited to come out and talk about what's happening with the taxi. So many years ago, we were in, asked whether we could build a solar powered taxi to uh, help transport pregnant women to hospital in Zimbabwe. We've taken forever to try and build this thing, but there it is. It works. It lives. <laughs> so it's, it's taken a long time, but we do finally have the, uh, the taxi going. So we've got a bit more work. Oh, and we've got Trev in the background as well. So, so uh, we've built a couple of cars. Yeah. So just ignore the 10 kilometer per hour signs you see around the place, because we certainly do. Uh, but filmed under controlled conditions. Uh, but, so the taxi goes, but uh, when, when I was invited to talk, I, I said, no, I can't talk about the taxi. It's, it's just still hasn't got anywhere. Uh, so what I'm actually going to talk about is uh, the World Solar Challenge. When I'm not building cars, uh, I'm also the chair of the uh, technical committee of the World Solar Challenge. And uh, it's a much more effective way to get cars built than trying to do it yourself. You basically, every, uh, every couple of years on World Environment Day, we send out a challenge to teams around the world to um, build solar powered cars. And they, uh, within 18 months or so, they've built some pretty swish cars. Um, so what I was going to talk about today is the, the upcoming World Solar Challenge. Uh, happens again in October. Um, and particularly the cruiser class, which is uh, when, when we built our little green car Trev many years ago, it was because we thought, well, you know, solar powered cars, they're good fun, but they're never really going to be practical. But I reckon maybe we might be wrong uh, because we've, we've put the challenge out a few uh, events ago. Can you build a practical solar car? And things are really moving in the, in the cruiser class. So um, just a, a really quick history of solar cars. Um, it's only 15 inches long. It's a model. Uh, so it was solar powered, but not really a solar powered car. Uh, so that was 1955. Um, 1960, uh, International Rectifier, who made solar cells, put a um, solar panel on a 1912 Baker electric car not really a solar car because you know it takes a lot more power from the grid than it does from the panel um has anyone noticed that uh, toyota has got a new prius out that's got solar panels all over the roof not really a solar car um so i couldn't find a, a photo but this was probably the first solar car as we think of them um so it's you know a specially built, really lightweight, efficient, well, maybe not so efficient, but lightweight vehicle with solar panels on it. And it gets most of its energy from the solar panels. It's still got a battery in it and you, you need a battery so that, you know, if the sun ducks behind a cloud or something, you're not stuck. But uh, so 1977, this was probably the first solar car. Uh, and uh, Ed Passerini was a, a, a lecturer at a university in the US and he got his students to design and build this. Um, 1982 and 83, Hans Tholstrup and Larry Perkins uh, built this sort of bathtub on wheels with a lid on it and drove it from Perth to Sydney. Um, and when, when they got to Sydney, a bunch of engineers stood around Hans and just said, ah, oh, you've built it all wrong. Um, so, you know, and, and he took, was it 23 days or something to, to do the trip, uh, 4,000 kilometres. Um, and so Hans uh, threw it back at them and said, well, you show us how to build solar cars. Um, meanwhile, in, in, in 1987, the, the, um, the Tour de Sol was building cars. They had something like 72 cars in their event. It was huge, but they were just racing around um, small street circuits in Switzerland or somewhere. Uh, that's not, not the same sort of calibre as um, Hans Tholstrup driving 4,000 kilometres across a continent. So the, uh, the 1987 also saw the, uh, the first World Solar Challenge um, listed here as the BP Solar Challenge and then uh, Hans had a bit of a falling out with BP so that was then the Pentax World Solar Challenge, um, 
and it was a big deal. Uh, so we had uh, Bob Hawke um, sort of launch the event, and uh, there's this is some photographs from the original brochures. Um, so cars start in Darwin, uh, head through Alice Springs to Adelaide, uh, and it took weeks for some of the cars to complete this this trip. Um, the the first three cars uh, in in the event I can't remember how many cars were in the first event. There would have been twenty or thirty maybe. Um, so the first three cars. So GM came in with their Sun Racer and 65 kilometers per hour. So that was pretty good. Um, the uh, Ford Australia um, came in with their local Model S. Uh, so this was a bunch of engineers from Geelong who uh, worked for Ford. They'd been messing around with uh, mileage marathon vehicles that you know used you know, half a thimble full of fuel to drive all day. So they knew a little bit about lightweight and so on. Uh, not so much about aerodynamics because they had this big tilting panel on the top, which uh, has, uh, you know, and for a few years that style of car was quite common and you often see them by the side of the road where they'd get blown off the road because of this huge sail that they're carrying along. Um, Spirit of Beale from uh, Beale, Switzerland, Sweden, Switzerland. I get, always get them mixed up. Okay, so this is the first event. The thing that you notice is 65 kilometres per hour. Uh, second place was 44 kilometres now. So GM was really way out ahead with, with their vehicle. And that, they threw some serious engineering behind this vehicle in order to, uh, to build and design this car. Um, so then three years later, it came back again. Um, first two places were uh, Beale again. So Beale was doing pretty good. And... This time we had Honda, oh sorry, so this is 1990 was, was Beale was the, the winner. I'm just showing the, the first place getters. Uh, 93 Honda came in with a, uh, the, Honda, the first Honda Dream. And look at the speeds, right? So 65 and then we're up to 85 kilometres an hour. Um, now there's some variation in speed every year because they all get different weather every year. Um, but, you know, we're up to 85 kilometres an hour uh, with the Honda. Um, so 93 was the year that um, I started in the World Solar Challenge with the Aurora team, which uh, came out of the, the Ford team. Uh, Honda came back in 96 with a two-seater car. Uh, so the regulations at the time, you were allowed eight square metres of solar panel for a single-seater car. If you built a two-seater car, there was no restriction on the number of cells you could put on the car, but the car had to be less than six metres long and two metres wide. Now that's an enormous car. Um, not even a Tesla is that big. These are uh, pretty big cars. But so they had a lot of solar panel on there and they also had two people in the car. Um, the passenger is facing backwards, looking out the rear window for the 3000 kilometres. Uh, so I, maybe, maybe Honda had never seen a car before. Uh, um, the um, 89.8 kilometres an hour. So, you know, really picking up the speed. Um, so Aurora, uh, so I was with the Aurora team and uh, Aurora won in 1999. So this is the first time an Australian team had, had won. Uh, it's the only time an Australian team has won. Um, so we were pretty happy with that. Uh, 73 kilometres an hour. Uh, I'm gonna blame the weather for that. Um, it, was, it was a pretty cloudy event, so. Um, that slowed teams down a bit. The, the style of the car too, um, this was the first time that team had put the driver in the middle of the solar panel. So they had kind of sacrificed some solar collection by, you know, you lose the windscreen and so on. Uh, but what you do get is much better aerodynamics and a much smaller, lighter car. Uh, and so this style of car with kind of three wheels and the driver sitting in the middle, uh, started to become, well, so the Aurora was the first to do it and it, uh, it became quite popular over the next few events, as you'll see. Um, 2001, uh, Nuon came in from, from, the, from the Netherlands, 91.8 kilometres an hour. 
uh, two, uh, sorry, 2001, 2003, same team again, 97 kilometres an hour. Um, you notice that the, uh, the, the driver is getting further and further back in the car, and that's basically so that you get an uninterrupted laminar airflow for as much as possible of the, of the solar car. Um, and if you're going to disturb the flow with the driver, we'll put it right at the back. Um, we had some regulation changes that um, we allowed different sorts of cells and uh, in 2005 Nuon came in with some gallium arsenide cells. Uh, they were kind of space grade. They came out of the Mars rover uh, program. Um, they were kind of left over from that. 102.8 kilometres an hour average speed, right? So that's, that's driving from eight in the morning till five in the evening with a couple of, couple of stops. So you, the cars have a stop every three or 400 kilometres for half an hour. But yeah, the average on-road speed was 102.8. Um, and at this stage, uh, it's starting to get a bit difficult to have a serious event when the teams, are, when, they, when they hit South Australia, they're up against 110 kilometre an hour speed limit. Um, so the, the teams, they're on the, they're on the public highway, they're on the Stewart Highway, they have to obey all the road rules and speed limits and that sort of thing. The roads are not closed or anything, it's, there's still trucks and things to, you know, uh, road trains and whatever. Um, so at that point we, for the 2007 event, we said, well, let's reduce the solar collector area down a bit from eight square metres down to six square metres. That'll slow them down a bit and it'll make it possible to have a more of a challenge. Well, yeah, it slowed them from 102 down to 90. So didn't didn't slow them down a lot. Um, <clears throat> 2009, Tokai came in and 11. Uh, they won a couple, so from Japan. Uh, and Nuon came in second. Um, once again, though, you know, it was six square metres. Now they're doing 100.6 kilometres an hour again. They're up over 100 kilometres an hour. Um, so in 2013, um, that last slide, they look like, that looked like the same car. Yeah, they, they, they do all start to look the same. Yeah. And it, it kind of started with the Aurora with the, let's put the driver in the middle of the panel and eventually everyone sort of converged onto this shape. Um, and so it came time to slow them down again. Uh, and at this stage, the event was kind of being run by the motorsport board in South Australia who said, well, if these things are supposed to be motor cars, then surely they should have four wheels. Uh, and so uh, the edict went out that solar cars shall have four wheels. Um, they're still, the committee is still divided about whether that was a good move or not, but it, it did slow the cars down. Um, and it kind of changed the design a little bit, but not much. They're still, you know, a, a driver sitting right at the back in a bubble, but this time they're off to one side in, in what's a bit like a catamaran. Um, and they're still doing 90 kilometres an hour average speed. And Nuna is still winning the event. Uh, they're just really hard to knock them off. Um, so in 2017, we said, all right, we've got to slow you down again. And we could have gone down to five square metres, but uh, we said, no, let's, let's really shake it up and go down to four square metres. And that, that really did have the effect of slowing them down. But the cars now are looking a little bit more, well, for a single-seater car, it's looking not so much like a, you know, a, a, um, uh, a yeah, aircraft carrier. It's looking a bit more sensible now. Um, I don't know that sensible is the right word. At this stage, so Nuon's just won again. Um, and a couple of the teams were thinking, you know, we can't really beat Nuon, they've just got so much money, so much experience, and they're just so good at this. And they wanted to think, you know, every time you take solar cars into Victoria Square, the question is, when am I going to be able to drive one of these things? Um, and you look at these and you think, well, there's, there's no way I can even fit in one of these, let alone drive it. Um, so we, we started what's now known as the Cruiser class. And we put the challenge out, can you build a car that's not just efficient, but also practical? Um, just before we move on to Cruiser, so here's the comparison of where we've come in uh, from 1987 to 2017. 
we've gone from 65 kilometres an hour up to 81, but we've halved the size of the solar array. So they're going faster on half the power. So yeah, very impressive. Um, okay, so the cruiser class, we said, show us a practical car. We didn't know what we meant by practical car, and we wanted to not restrict the, the teams from being, you know, we, we don't want to stop teams from being innovative. Um, so how many seats does a, does a cruiser have? We don't care. Put as many seats in it as you like. Um, uh, and so the, the, the top three positions were Eindhoven. So this is a first time in the event. Another team from the Netherlands come in uh, with a car that averaged 70 kilometres an hour with three people in it. Um, so, you know, really impressive. Uh, so Bochum uh, came in with a three-seater car and University of New South Wales with a two-seater car. Um, and, you know, any of those cars could have won. In fact, University of New South Wales, if, if they'd got their act together earlier in, in the event, they, they prob probably could have beaten uh, Eindhoven. Um, but it's, there's an interesting problem here. How do you compare a four-seater car to a two-seater car uh, in a way that's kind of fair? Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, 2015, Eindhoven again. It's those pesky Dutch. And meanwhile, <laughs> at the same time, the, uh, the Nuon is, is still winning the, uh, the, the Challenger class with the single-seaters. Um, Koga Kuhn from Japan came in with this thing and a, a lot of the cruiser teams are looking at that saying, oh, it's not really a cruiser car. It's, it's, it's more of a, uh, you know, a, a, a challenger car that they've just somehow managed to squeeze an extra person into. Um, not really practical. Um, and then Bochum keeps coming back with some really nice designs. And then last year, Eindhoven again. This time they've gone... So their, their concept was always to go with a, a family car. And, and so they went for the five-seater car this time. So they had five people in the car. Um, they didn't, you don't have to carry five people all the way, but uh, you get extra points for carrying more people. Um, Bochum again. And um, Team Arrow from, uh, from Queensland um, came in. Um, now... The, the challenge is though, how do you manage, you know, when you say to a bunch of teams, you can build whatever you like. Uh, we put a restriction on the amount of solar you can have, but we're gonna let some team, you know, we're gonna be comparing four-seater, five-seater cars to two-seater cars, and somehow we have to uh, declare a winner. So the, um, the 2019 World Solar Challenge is the same as previous events or the last few events where we have three classes. We have the Challenger class, which is for the single seat cars. When we first announced the, uh, the Cruiser class, um, where, you know, traditionally solar cars are just, it's single person in the most ridiculous, efficient solar car you can build and just race them to Adelaide, get there as quickly as possible. And we came up with this new class that's, uh, you know, practical and you get points for practicality and, and all this other thing. And we weren't sure what reaction we were going to get from the community when we announced it. And, and it was divided. It was half, half the team saying, this is the end of solar car racing as we know it. And the other half saying, this is a great new direction for the event. And because we kind of equally offended 50% of the, the community, we, we think we've struck the balance about right. Um, so cruiser class is for an efficient, practical solar car with two or more seats. Um, and cruiser class is scored on efficiency and practicality, whereas challenger class is just whoever gets to Adelaide first is, is the winner. And we still have uh, an adventure class for teams that um, have got cars, they're not quite up to the current regulations, but come along and enjoy the adventure anyway. So the, we always get, uh, you know, there's a couple of high schools from the US who will come across and just enjoy the adventure of driving across the outback in a car that they've cobbled together themselves. Um, so cruisers have to be practical as well as efficient. Uh, and this year we've put a restriction on the number of seats because the, the move from four seats to five seats 
sort of signal that teams might turn up with minibuses and uh, or maybe not even minibuses but the other thing is the um, the tyre so Bridgestone is a major sponsor and the solar car tyres that they uh, that they supply for teams uh, have got weight limits and uh, you know once you start putting five people in the car it's getting a little bit much so for those tyres so we we've said you can build any number of seats you like but we're only going to allow you to put four people in the car at once um, but we've still got this problem of how do we decide who's got the best car when there's no real rules about you know making the cars consistent um, so it's efficiency versus practicality uh, and so oh, I'm a mathematician so here's a formula for you all uh, it would be remiss of me to come out and not bring one so we have some sort of efficiency score E and some sort of practicality score P and we we multiply the E by 80 percent and the you know so you get 80 percent of your score is efficiency and 20 percent is practicality uh, where do we get those numbers from? Well, we kind of guessed in the first World Solar Challenge of Cruiser class how practical the cars were going to be, how much variation we were going to get. And we, we just basically wanted to make it as difficult as possible for teams to decide whether to build an efficient car or a practical car. So we kind of worked out of something that was just going to make life difficult for the teams because as the kind of the scientific faculty for the event, that is our aim. Uh, the aim of the teams is to take our carefully crafted regulations and work around them somehow. But uh, so we, we had this and there's a, a major flaw with this uh, that we kind of knew was lurking in the background and no one really exploited it though. There were a couple of threats from teams that were, and that is you can, you can build a car that's got zero practicality uh, and if your efficiency is high enough you can still win the event uh, and we didn't really like that uh, and it, we knew it was only a matter of time before someone was going to do that um, and you know if you want to build a car that's just all efficiency and no practicality build a challenger car we really wanted to promote the idea of um, practicality so a new formula we do this we take your efficiency score and we multiply it by your practicality score so if you've got low practicality you're going to get a low score and if you've got low efficiency you're going to get a low score um, it kind of a, a cynic would say that we're rewarding <coughs> mediocrity but we like to think that we're striking a nice balance uh, so uh, and when we came up with this form of scoring I was expecting a, a huge backlash from the community and so I prepared a, a sort of a blog post that we were going to put on the on the World Solar Challenge website that was explaining all the details and all the thousands of simulations I'd done and all of this sort of thing. We put this out and there was just silence from the community. <laughs> so, so, now, so now I get to tell you all about all the thousands of simulations I did in order to, uh, to do this. Okay, so that's, so this is how we balance efficiency and practicality, uh, but how do we measure these things? And this is the fine print, it's in the regulations, you don't have to read this, but basically the practicality score is determined by a panel of judges uh, and they tell you things, they, they are told to consider design innovation, environmental impact, ease of access and egress, occupant space and comfort, ease of operation, versatility, style and desirability, and suitability for the declared purpose. So that's all really pretty vague uh, and so we're quite proud of that. Um, <laughs> and, teams, and teams say to us, you've got to give us a hint, tell us what to build. And we say to them, no actually we're not going to. And, and we've, we've been even tougher this year because the, the teams keep on insisting how are you going to calculate the practicality <laughs> score. So we've told them exactly how we're going to do it this year. We say, oh well we're going to have a bunch of judges give you a score between uh, not in 100%, they're going to consider these things and we're not going to tell the judges how much weight to place on each of these criteria. So now the teams know exactly how it's going to be done and they're still not happy. But, <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it's the problem that any, 
any car designer faces. What do you, what do you build? Do you, you know, how do you decide the trade-off between the practicality and the efficiency and all these different things? So let the teams have, have uh, fun with it. And it, it. it means that teams can still you know, play with this balance. Um, efficiency then, how do we measure the efficiency? When, how do you compare a four-seater car to a, a two-seater car? Um, one of the sad facts too of the cruiser class is because we, we like to get everybody into Adelaide on the Friday. So the, the first World Solar Challenge took weeks to complete the event. We just don't have that luxury anymore. The police want us off the Stewart Highway before the Saturday morning. Uh, so we, you know, we've only got Sunday to, to Friday to get everyone into Adelaide. Um, so because you, you potentially, well, you're building a, a, a bigger car, it's got practicality. Practicality costs you efficiency. So the, these cars use more energy from, uh, well, they've got to get it from somewhere um, to, to drive from Darwin to Adelaide. So we let these cars recharge from the grid, um, but we penalise them for recharging from the grid. So what we do is we, we, take, we, we say, all right, we're going to take the number of people you transport um, and the number of kilometres you transport those people. So we multiply the, basically each, every person, you multiply that person by the number of kilometres they, they travel. So you're measuring how much work the car is doing, how much useful work transporting people. And we divide that by the energy, external energy use. So this is kind of an efficiency figure. How much useful work are you getting out of this car for the amount of external energy that you're, you're putting into it? And... Um, this year we're in three stages. We, we, we've kind of been messing around with when do we let the cars recharge. And last time we said, we don't care when you recharge, you can recharge whenever you like, we're just going to penalise you for it. And they all got out and recharged every night. And we think, oh, that's not really solar cars. Um, and, and we missed out on the opportunity of saying, here is an electric car. Uh, and this year it's going to be in three stages, Darwin to Tennant Creek, Tennant Creek to Coober Pedy. That's 1,193 kilometres. Uh, and Cooper PD to Adelaide. We want you to do each of those stages in two days and you're not allowed to recharge from the grid in between. All right? So these cars have to be able to do 1,193 kilometres without plugging in. Um, who's got an electric car? Right. <laughs> Whose electric car can do that? <laughs> Furthermore, they have to be able to do it at 75 kilometres an hour on road speed. Uh, so uh, we're expecting that there's going to be a lot of teams that don't achieve this, but we're unapologetic about being a difficult event. It's a challenge. Uh, so last, <laughs> last, last time we, had, we, we set a, a, a target of 65 kilometres an hour, I think, and only three teams completed the event on time. So we did what we had to do. We just said, all right, well, this time you've got to do it at 75. Just build better cars. Um, and we've gone from... Uh, I think we had eight cruiser teams in the first challenge. We've got 20 this year. Um, so the other interesting challenge we've got is we've told these 20 cars that they can, they can all charge up if they like at Tennant Creek and Coober Pedy. I don't know if anyone's seen the EV charging facilities at <laughs> Tennant Creek and Coober Pedy. So in, in the interest of, you know, we, we always like to bite off more than we can chew. Uh, so... <laughs> Working with CSIRO, we're building a portable 20 station power station that we're going to, you know, 20 EV. And, and we've, we've said to the teams, it's got to be a Type 2 Menekes plug. You've, it's, you know, it's, it's the proper stuff. Um, and we've got, uh, well, <laughs> so don't tell anyone, we've actually got 18 chargers um, that we're going to drag down the highway. And we've got power authorities. That, uh, that are going to let us plug into, uh, you know, a 180 amp supply, <laughs> and uh, we're going to charge up these cars. In, and, and they have to charge up because we like to sleep at night. They're going to arrive. They start charging at sunset, and they have to be finished by 11. So they only get four hours to uh, to charge, and we limit them to 30 amps, single phase. So, uh, so they still have to be pretty efficient. Um, so, uh, who's going to win this event? So um, I did a whole bunch of simulations and it doesn't matter what the numbers are, but it's basically we've got brightness along the bottom and 
score up on the on the vertical axis and the red dots are the two-seater cars so the more the brighter you go the better the score you're going to get the the the, the one right at the top is the scores for a, a car that's got zero practicality and it's just built for efficiency, it's two-seater. Um, but all of the others, you can see they're, they're kind of the two-seater, the three-seater, the four-seater, there's even a five-seater in there. They're, they're kind of all just mixed in together. Everything gets a better score if it's brighter. Um, what we've worked out is that if you build an efficient two-seater car, you m have a slight advantage if the weather's good, uh, and if you build a four-seater car, you've got a slight advantage if the weather's bad, um, because you, you carry more batteries, but and you're not so reliant on the sun. But it should be pretty much a fair uh, event, we hope. Um, so October teams will start heading up to, so this is Hidden Valley in, um, in Darwin, so it would basically we'll all be, we've got 50 teams have signed up, I think. That kind of dropped back to 48, and then we've got someone else as a late starter, so we've, I think we're back up to 49 teams. They'll all assemble at Hidden Valley in Darwin for a week or two, and then we, we spend a week scrutineering the cars just to make sure that they're, they're um, all fit for purpose and meet all of our regulations. So we have a couple of days, or well, we have a week of scrutineering. Um, and then on Sunday, the teams basically leave Darwin and head down the Stewart Highway. Uh, so that's the 13th of October. And then the following week, uh, on the Thursday, the first cars will come in, the cruisers will come in on the Friday. Um, and we'll all be set up in Victoria Square. So there we are, Bridgestone World Solar Challenge, 13th to the 20th of October. Get out and have a look and see, see what these, these ridiculously bright engineers can do with a few solar cells and a packet of carbon fibre. So thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> Questions, yeah. Are you, are you aware of the Lightyear? I, so yeah, so the Lightyear car was built by, so Eindhoven who uh, uh, built, there we go, this car. That's an ugly looking bus, but uh, <laughs> So yeah, the, the guy the, the guy who was uh, was a couple uh, three or four team members from the Eindhoven team uh, are building the Lightyear car. So it's I've I've seen yeah yeah I've I've I have, haven't seen it in person now. So uh, so the guy who so it's it's a it's a pretty nice looking car. Uh, it's solar powered. Unlike sort of the Toyota, it it really is designed to be solar powered. So it gets a lot of its power from solar. That you you. you you know, you, you put it out, I think, I can't remember what the figures are, but you put it out in the sun for a day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the guy, the guy that's doing the light here, we're bringing him out uh, to do some of those, uh, the judging for the cruiser class and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. well, well, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, because some of us were last in looking at the adventure class, we read the rules. Yeah. And I wondered, with that speed limit and that really long leg there, is there still a limit on the hours of the day they can be on the road as well? Yeah. So. Um, uh, so the so the question is, uh, with with with, is, is there limits to how long you can be on the road? Because you know, achieving um, the, the, the sort of the speeds that are required can be a challenge. Um, so th there, there's a basic limit that we can't have cars on the road uh, before sunrise or after sunset. And as a fatigue management thing, we try and keep, well, so the, the regulations say you're allowed, to, you're allowed to drive between eight in the morning and five in the afternoon. Um, now, when you when you stop driving in the afternoon, there's still two hours or three hours of sunlight left. So you just pick your car up, point it at the sun, and collect the energy ready for the next day. Um, but there are also we be, one of the problems with the cruisers last year doing 65 kilometres an hour was that the road trains are doing 100 kilometres an hour, 
uh, and we, we insist that all cars are capable of doing 60 kilometres an hour at least. Um, otherwise, you're not going to make it to Adelaide anyway in, within the, the time allowed. But just the difference in speed between a road train and a, doing 100 and a solar car doing 60 is, uh, is a bit frightening. So just, you know, we, we, we really um, want the cars to be as compatible as possible with the rest of the traffic on the Stuart Highway. And our answer to... You know, this is really hard. Uh, we, we, we're struggling to keep up to 60 kilometres an hour. Is well, build a better car. Uh, so uh, there are teams that can do like some of the teams are doing 80, 90 kilometres an hour. So and and the aim is to basically bring everybody standard up. Um, and and teams really kind of in Darwin, they spend a week in and out of each other's pit garages, looking at how things are done and really learning from each other. So we, we ballast drivers up to 80 kilograms. So that means that if you weigh more than 80 kilograms, you're probably not going to get a gig as a solar car driver. But uh, that, I mean, that, that's something that we can look at for future regulations. But, you know, we, we have, if we didn't do that, teams would just put the lightest people in the car and not necessarily the most suitable people for driving the car. So everyone's ballasted up to 80 kilograms. For each driver, just one driver, right? Full length, or yeah. Have a changeover? So, so each, so a team would, a small team would typically have three solar car drivers, um, and maybe maybe two, and you wouldn't have fewer than about ten people on a team. So you have you have to run with support vehicles. You need a car in front and a car behind with solar uh, with flashing lights and things. Um, there are ten control stops along the way. So you might have to drive for four, four hours or so before you can get a chance to, right, you, you can change drivers whenever you like. You, know, you just pull over by the side of the road, stop and change drivers. Uh, teams don't do that because stopping means someone will go past you. So they only ever change drivers at the control stops, which could be, you know, four hours apart, five hours. So, yeah, and it's pretty gruelling stuff. The, Air conditioning is not real flash in these cars. There's none. Uh, well, it, it, they basically work on evaporative air conditioning. You, you sweat an awful lot because they they run about 10 degrees above ambient temperature, so it's you know 45 degrees in there, and then you get a bit of air blowing across just to evaporate that. What's the top speed the best car has ever attained? Top speed. Uh, so. I reckon uh, University of New South Wales might have tried for a Guinness Book of Records at 160 kilometres an hour or, or something like that. The, um, how fast do you want them to go? The, the, the thing is, the, you, they're built to, be, to, to drive at a constant speed. The most efficient thing to, drive, to do is to drive at a constant speed of, you know, around about 80 kilometres an hour for the top teams. And so there's no point in building a car that can go much faster than that. You need to go a little bit faster for overtaking and so on, but teams will really try and control their speed to the nearest, you know, half a kilometre an hour or so uh, to make sure that they're getting the best performance out of the car. Speed limit of 110 in South Australia, it's 130 in, uh, New South, in, in uh, Northern Territory. There we go. They're all they're all pretty vague, <laughs> and 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 we don't tell who we don't tell people who the judges are going to be. Who declares the purpose in that last category? Oh, so so the so the team will say, yeah, we built this as a Ute, or you know, we built this as a family car, or whatever, and then this the judges will say. <laughs> 
and and that's fine. You you can declare it to be a slow car, and the and the judges can look at it and say, well, practically yes, this is a slow car, and then they multiply it by your efficiency score, which is <laughs> whatever. But so slow cars don't cut it because you do have to be able to do 75 kilometres an hour. Who tallies up all of these things? Uh, so. So we do that, so, uh, so judging is on the Saturday in Victoria Square. Uh, it's going to be a bit different this year. We, uh, each car, each team will basically be wheeled up onto a podium. They have to give a three minute presentation, and that's to the public, uh, about their car, what's special about it and so on. And then, you know, the judges are watching that and then the judges can go around and kick the tyres and jump in the car and see what it goes like and that sort of thing. We. <laughs> We, we did, we, 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 one year we picked a judge from CSIRO who was very, very tall and said, oh, yeah, get into this. And, and one team failed one of the practicality categories because another of our judges was a reporter from Channel 7 who was wearing a very tight pencil skirt, <laughs> couldn't get into the car. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. last question, um, Richard. Yeah. Do they, uh, does the criteria have to be the same for each judge for each? Um, when he's... No, well, so so the, the judges are asked to consider all these things, and and when we choose judges, uh, the judges are they they could be someone from the automotive industry, or uh, you know we, we might choose an automotive journalist or something, or we you know in one year we just picked a reporter from Channel Seven who just happened to be <laughs> wandering past at the time, and we said you know so so the teams. <laughs> The teams don't know who we're going to pick as judges, and because it's practicality, the, the, the technical merits of the car have already been tested on the drive from Darwin to Adelaide. So, yeah, we, we look for a variety in our judges, um, and, <laughs> and we don't know who the judges are going to be, and we probably won't know who the judges are going to be until the Saturday when we all arrive in Darwin and look around and see. So we do, we do have, we have some international people coming across who will be on the judging panel, but there'll be a bunch of judges that we just pick out of whoever's there. Yeah. Okay, thank you.